Now I am very honored to welcome the president of the Illinois Network of Charter Schools, Andrew Broy. Andrew, come on up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me on this great day. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the City Club for inviting me to speak and to President Jay Doherty for creating a venue where we can discuss critical topics for the future of our city. And in my view, there's no more important topic that, for our city than the state of public schools. And today I'd like to offer a few thoughts on the increased school choice system we've put in place over the past 25 years. I'll not be talking about different types of schools as such. Instead, I want to focus on a single question, whether enhanced school choice has been a net positive for the city or a net negative. To do that, we conducted a study that examined every high school student in the city and the performance of the school they attend. But before I get to that, I want to set the stage. So let me take you back to 1990 for some context. Mayor Daley was in his second year in office. For all the football fans in the crowd, the Chicago Bears were 11 and five that year. Yeah. Most important though, they beat the Packers twice quite handily. The average home price in Chicago, any guesses? $103,000. And the Oscar winning film that year in a major upset beating out Goodfellas was Dances with Wolves. So that's Chicago in 1990. In the school system, we had 105,000 high school students enrolled in one of 72 high schools. All the high schools were operated by CPS, and the vast majority of students attended their local neighborhood high school. Typically large, comprehensive schools spread around the city. We had a few specialty schools, but they were the exception. Fast forward 25 years. We now have 100,600 high school students, and they're enrolled in one of 140 high schools. So lower enrollment and almost twice as many high schools. We now have selective high schools, charter public schools, turnaround schools, military academies, all sorts of high school options. And let me say a moment, a few words about charter public schools, which are commonly misunderstood. Charter schools are public schools operated under a charter or contract between a local school district and a nonprofit board. The charter itself is a performance contract between the school district and that nonprofit group. The contract provides operational flexibility in exchange for a promise of increased student achievement. Contrary to what you might hear, there is no such thing as a for-profit charter school. In Illinois, under our state law, every charter school is a nonprofit organization. They're publicly funded, open to all students, and granted their charter by a local school board. Unlike selective schools like Whitney Young and others, they have no admissions criteria. Many of these schools were founded by CPS teachers and communities. In the audience today, we have some of those people. Mike Milkey was a teacher at Wells High School when he founded Noble Street Charter Academy. <laughs> Kwame Nkrumah Charter Academy was founded by a group of pastors on the south side. And Erie Charter School was founded by the Erie Neighborhood House based on an award-winning pre-K program that stretches back more than 100 years in Chicago. There are dozens more just like this. Now, as we've seen, there are now far more high school options in the city. We decided to examine whether the dramatic increase in options has had a net positive impact on our city's academic achievement. Note that we're not trying to pit one type of public school against another here, but trying to answer the question, has this been good for students? So what did we do? We examined the address of every student enrolled in Chicago Public School and determined which school they actually attended. We then looked at whether the student enrolled in their zoned high school or their attended school. We focused on high school because that's where the most dramatic enrollment trends persist. 
I expected to find a high degree of student mobility and enrollment patterns, but even I was shocked at the degree. So what was our first finding? First, taken as a whole, only 27% of CPS high school students choose to attend their assigned zoned school. This is a dramatic departure from 25 years ago. One clear conclusion from this data, we already have a choice district at the high school level. There are relatively few students who decide to enroll in local high schools. But we still, in our city, have a presumption of place-based schooling that is at odds with the reality for most families. Our second finding, the majority of the students who opt out of their local zoned high school attend another district-run school, not a charter school. Fully 69% of students choose a district-run high school when they opt out. Charter schools represent the other 31%. As a result, and contrary to what you might hear, the growth of charter public schools in Chicago is not the main driver of students leaving their zone schools. Finding three, a more important question, is this student enrollment mobility good or bad in terms of student performance? Are students who leave their local schools attending higher quality schools elsewhere? One way to examine this question is to look at whether students are more likely to opt out if their school is low performing. The results here were clear and intuitive. The lower the performance level of the school, the more likely students are to opt out. Among schools with the highest performance ranking, one plus, 58% of zone students stayed home. At the other end of the performance distribution, level three, only 7% of students chose to attend their zone school. 93% found options elsewhere. Finding four, which I think is most important. We looked at all high schools system-wide to determine whether these patterns have led to more students attending higher performing schools. And the answer is unequivocal. 96% of students who leave their zoned high school wind up in a higher performing or equally performing school. 73% is the number for higher performing. This trend holds even if one includes selective enrollment schools like Northside, Peyton, Whitney Young, etc. Some context here, in 2001, we were at 48% opting out. Last year, 70%. So the trend has continued each of the past 15 years. Now, some might argue that this is creating too much chaos in the system. But I can't quite understand that argument if the result is that more students are attending higher performing schools. Unlike 25 years ago, where zip code truly determined educational opportunity, today parents are finding better schools by any means necessary. However, this doesn't mean there aren't consequences, and we should address those. It's challenging for any family and child to travel the distances they do today to go to school, to find a safe option. I spoke with a young lady two weeks ago at our annual conference who attends Chicago Math and Science Charter Academy in Rogers Park, 49th Ward. Um, guess where she lives? The Roseland community, the far south side. Now this is Chicago. I know we complain about commutes all the time, but imagine this journey. Up before the crack of dawn, walk to a bus, take the bus to the south end of the red line, <clears throat> red line all the way to Rogers Park, another bus, walk a half mile to school, twice a day. Thousands of students do that. That's a consequence of our lack of high quality options across the city. We should also confront the reality of twice as many schools serving fewer students. I don't know many organizations that are able to sustain a shrinking customer base while adding capacity. And the simple reality is that the lowest performing high schools have been losing students for decades. The effect is most pronounced among a dozen or so formerly comprehensive high schools across our city. The conventional wisdom has been that these schools have lost population because the communities have lost population, or charters are draining students. As we have seen, the charter claim is not borne up by the evidence, but neither is the population loss claim. Let's look at these data. Consider these five traditional high schools, or 
Harlan, Tilden, Robeson, and Hirsch. The numbers on the chart represent the total students who live in that attendance area. 3,431 in the case of Orr. And how many local students attend that school? 284. You can see the numbers until you get to Hirsch of 2,190 zoned high school students who go to public school and live in the Hirsch attendance zone. 83 attend. So what is happening? The problem is not that these communities have simply lost population. It is that parents who live there have lost faith in the schools. And we should listen to the wisdom of parents. Too much policy in our city is made in boardrooms without regard to local community input or thinking. Well, guess what? Parents know. The families who live there know what the schools are offering, and they've opted out. The result, the positive result, is they're finding better schools. The negative result is they have to still deal with Hirsch and Orr and Tilden. One example of the opting out is urban prep. And Tim King will join us later for remarks about his experience. But if you look at Tim King's Bronzeville campus in Urban Prep, the star represents Urban Prep's campus in Inglewood. Every other dot represents schools from which they draw students. The most important part about this data, though, is that of the 443 students enrolled at Urban Prep, 418 of them have found a better, higher performing option by opting out locally and going to Urban Prep Inglewood's campus. Again, parents know. So let me return to the question I began my remarks with. Has expanded school choice led to better high schools than ever before? The answer is yes. But how many? We now have an exact answer. Each dot on this chart will represent 1,000 public Chicago high school students. There are now 57,308 high school students attending a higher performing high school because of enhanced school options in our city. Some are charter, some are traditional district, some are magnet, some are selective, some are theme schools, but these are families making choices. And those choices are resulting in overall higher attainment, higher college going rates, higher ACT averages, and better outcomes for our city. That should be applauded, not criticized. And let me close with two recommendations based on these data. And, and an aside here. One of the frustrations I have is when we have academic studies done, and it seems like every study ends with this line. More research is needed. And I've always thought of that as kind of the perpetual employment policy for professors, because they will then wind up doing more studies about the previous studies. Well, I'm going to offer two recommendations that don't need more study, that need implementation. The first one. Chicago has an extraordinarily complicated application process at the high school level. Most of the 140 high schools have a separate application. The result is that a CPS parent navigating this process is confronted with different timelines, different applications, and confusion reigns. I can't tell you how many calls we get in our office from parents of all over the city who are asking about charter application windows or district-run schools, and all we can do is show them a spreadsheet that is about eight pages long of different time periods. We can do better as a city. Let's streamline the application process, consolidate enrollment, and create consistent enrollment time frames for all CPS high schools. Second, and somewhat more controversial, we have clung to the notion of local high school attendance zones, even as the reality has become that comparatively few, stu few students use them. For the 27% of students who default to their local high school, consider this modest proposal. What if we enrolled them, instead of their traditional school, the highest performing high school with space within three miles of their address? Make that simple default change. Now, they could always opt out of that if they wanted to, want to retain their local neighborhood high school preference, they could do that. 
But we could end the days when the default is based on zip code. Instead, we can make quality the driving factor. This would result in many more students attending higher performing high schools across our city. And that is something we should all be able to get behind. I began my career as a high school teacher, a ninth and 10th grade teacher. And I spent a number of years as a civil rights lawyer, trying school finance cases and fighting for equal access for educational opportunity. I'm sometimes asked by people why we support charter public schools in Chicago when they serve only a portion of the students. But I submit to you, this is the wrong question. It isn't about charter public schools versus other types of public schools. It's about better schools, however organized, particularly for students in communities without consistent access to quality. And as these data prove, enhanced choice is driving that. We should continue to expand on that while we think about ways to make sure the impact is not negative in communities across Chicago. Thank you. Let me now invite to the stage two respondents who are going to give us their take on these data. Uh, Gary Chico and Tim King, if you can come on up and I'll say a few words about each of them. They really need no introduction, um, but Gary Chico, we probably know, was chief of staff to Mayor Daley. He headed up the CPS school board for a number of years when some of these policies started. And he was head of the ISBE board, along with a variety of other boards in the city, a true civic champion in Chicago. And Tim King, the founder, president, and CEO of the Urban Prep Academies, an all-male charter academy, three campuses across Chicago, a, a pipeline to college, great results out of Urban Prep, and they're here to join us. Um, give them a round of applause today, please. So Gary, a question for you first. You served as CPS board chair when many of these policies were first implemented. What are your reactions to this trend 25 years later? Well, first of all, let me uh, congratulate you on an excellent presentation. Uh, I think that sheds light. Facts matter. <laughs> and um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and Inks. And I appreciate Jay Doherty and all the members of the City Club making this forum available. Uh, I have my wife here, who's my best supporter of all, son. And to all of the uh, educators in the room uh, who do a fantastic job every day, uh, primarily in this room, charter schools who are making children's lives better, as Andrew has uh, laid out very com in a com very compelling way. Uh, your question was, uh, how do I feel after 20 years of having started the issuance of the first charters back in, I think it was 1996 or seven? Um, I feel good. I feel good because I think your data shows uh, what we thought about in the early, early days of the first issuance of charters, that parents deserve a choice to find the best option for their child to get a high quality education. And it's not limited to one structure, as Andrew described in 1990, that comprised the Chicago public school system. I think if you look at anything that's really uh, transpired over the last 20 years, the, uh, the changes that have taken place in our society, whether it be with social media, whether it be with mobility. Right now, these kids get on buses and trains and they're all over the place. Doesn't phase them a bit. So I would only challenge the distance thing because a lot of these kids will go wherever they have to go on public transportation to get there. But I feel very good with the array of options that have been made available to parents. I think it, frankly, has saved our city in a lot of respects. Because could you imagine Alderman Moore? Here's one of the supporters of charter schools. I have a lot of respect for Joe Moore and what he's done to allow charter schools to flourish in his ward. But could you imagine Alderman Moore getting a property tax bill as a parent with no place to go? Can you imagine getting that property tax bill and the number one item on your property tax bill is Chicago Board of Education District 599. You have a house that a few hundred thousand dollars, so there's your bill of $16,000, and 9,800 says CPS. 
But you can't, Andrew showed you that if you're stuck only in the zone that you're in, you may not feel so good. I think charters have been responsible for actually stabilizing the taxpaying base of the city by giving them options. But if you look also at the aggregate data over 20 years, ACT scores have risen to the highest level in anybody's memory, largely driven by charters, not only. I mean, Chicago Public Schools are doing a great job, and there's a lot of options now offered. But these charter schools have helped lead the way on ACT scores, have helped lead the way on, gradu on, on college application, acceptance, and graduation rates that are some of the highest we've seen. That's because people, like many of you in the room, work on this every day in an obsessive way to make children learn and know that they can succeed. It's done at Noble, it's done at Tim's organization, which I'm a big, admi I'm a big admirer of, because it debunks the myth that you can't succeed. And so I feel really, really good over 20 years to look at what's transpired and what has been the end result for parents. Now, do we have a ways to go? Oh, you bet, you bet. I think one of the major themes in this entire conversation is if you don't adapt to current tastes and demands, you will perish. You will perish. Anybody ever remember Blockbuster? Right? <laughs> Anybody remember Kodak? Right? We can keep going. I mean, you either understand what people want today and try to serve them, which was the major impetus in 1996, 1997 for the first charters. We didn't sit in a room and lock the door and say, what can we conjure up that's going to be really good? These were ideas brought by parents that wanted change for their children. So I feel very good about what's transpired. I think your questions are very provocative, that the job is not done. There's some very important questions here about right-sizing the portfolio. I mean, poor Forrest Claypool was here yesterday with only a half a billion dollar problem. I mean, and a lot of it is carrying this around. I mean, we have to be, we have to be really, really serious about confronting what we're up against here. And then we won't have to be subject to the whims of Springfield. I mean, we, that's a very, very tough place to be. I'd like to control our own destiny a lot more than we're doing right now. Yeah, right. But I hope that's a short answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tim, moving to you. Uh, you founded the network of three charter public schools designed to serve young African-American men in the city. How do you see Urban Prep's role in creating educational opportunity here? Thanks, Andrew. I, I also want to thank the City Club for having us. Andrew, great presentation. I got to give a couple shout outs in case I don't get a chance to do so at the end. First and foremost, to my parents, my mom and dad, who have been coming to my stuff <laughs> since I was conceived, literally. I've been around since the very beginning, and I appreciate them uh, still hanging out. We've got a great team from Urban Prep that's in the house. Um, Lionel Allen, who's our chief academic officer, I get to stand up here and talk, but Lionel's the person that does so much of the important work in the, in the back and makes everything that happens at Urban Prep uh, happen. Uh, Alderman Moore, great supporter, thanks a lot for everything. And I gotta shout out the general superintendent and CEO of Chicago Park District, T uh, Mike Kelly, who's in the house. Uh, I'm on the Parks Commission Board, and uh, it's great to serve with, with him. Uh, so on to your question, um, oh, we've got two urban prep students who are here too, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so make sure you say hello to them. So I, can, I think there are a couple ways urban prep has, has made a difference. Uh, one um, is we have disrupted the trajectory of a group of students, and this is something that I think a bunch of charter schools uh, in the city have uh, been able to do. Uh, when we started Urban Prep, the data were showing that 2.5% of African-American males who started out in Chicago public schools would end up earning a college degree uh, by the time they were 25. 2.5%, one in 40. Uh, Urban Prep uh, happens, we have a 100% college acceptance rate for our graduates. We have a 75% college <laughs> persistence rate. Um, and, and, and these are ways we are disrupting What's happening? Um, one in nine African American males enrolling in college from Chicago public schools last year was an urban prep graduate. One in nine. Um, that just goes to show you the difference one organization institution can make in what's happening. So disrupting the, uh, the trajectory. Uh, secondly, I think we're inspiring folks and, and kind of inspiring a new type of a conversation. Uh, you know, I think it's no coincidence that nowadays everyone's talking about 100% college acceptance. 
Uh, we've got uh, Shane is here, Shane Evans from the University of Chicago Charter School. I saw a bus pass by that had an ad on it. Um, it said 100% of our graduates are accepted to college. And I was like, oh, it's an urban prep ad. It was like, no, it's University of Chicago <laughs> Charter School. Wait a second. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna take credit for what's happening at U of C as well. Um, yeah, so I think that we're, we're, we're inspiring a, a conversation, um, inspiring the district to think about things in a, in a, in a different way. And then thirdly, uh, we're changing the narrative. Um, you know, I think folks in this room, in this country, have an idea of what it is to be an African-American male, and I don't know that that idea is consistent with what the reality is. It certainly isn't consistent with the reality of the 1,200 students we serve at Urban Prep. These guys aren't gangbangers, they aren't murderers, they aren't thieves, they aren't criminals. They are positive contributors to society and have potential to do tremendous things, and the fact that Urban Prep exists allows us to help change the narrative around what it means to be a young black man in this city and in this country. Good for you, man. Good for you. So one follow-up on that, Tim. Uh, folks may not know this, but CPS is one of the only districts in the country now that actually evaluates high schools, in part based on how well they get students into and through college. Tim, based on your experience, is that a positive trend? Has that changed the way principals focus on college enrollment at the high school level? Yeah, I think, I think it's tremendously positive. It's a good thing. All, all the data out there show that if you have a college degree, you will make more money, you will have less contact with the criminal justice system, you will have better health, you will live longer. Literally, there are studies that show that if you have a college degree, you are likely to live longer than someone without a college degree. So having a degree for our students is a matter of life and death. If we talk about preparing students for college, getting them to college, getting them through college, then what we're doing is we're enabling these young people to live longer. So I think it's appropriate that we look at data like that when evaluating uh, what schools are doing. Also, CPS um, has, all has said recently that the goal is a 100% career and college ready. If you're going to say that you want all of your graduates to be career or college ready, you need to measure that. And so I think the focus on actually looking at college enrollment and college persistent data um, are, are really important. Good. And then, Gary, you mentioned earlier um, Forrest Claypool was here yesterday talking about the deficit CPS faces. In a resource-constrained environment like we have today, <clears throat> how can we ensure that providing high school options is consistent with the goal of creating stronger schools across the city for everybody? I don't think there's anything more important confronting the city than that issue. I think we have to continue to move uh, down the path that you've seen that the data shows by offering, continuing to offer good quality high school options and elementary school options in every part of the city. I was really, really disappointed in the city council's uh, introduction of a resolution signed by almost 40 aldermen, the calling for a moratorium on choice. And I asked myself, I said, what are we doing here? This has to be political expedience at its best. This is not what we're about. We need to have courage, not, not demur right now. We need to have courage, like Alderman Burke did, Alderman Moore, and standing up for that high school on 47th in California. We have more of those in the city that are coming. And the idea is this. If somebody's going to come forward with a better program that offers students a better opportunity to get a better education, to get into college or get into the workplace right away, we ought to grab it. We ought not be stuck in the old notions of, well, I had a building over here on such and such an address and there's people in it and I got to keep it. That is the wrong construct. So I think we need to muster the courage to head down the road that this data and that this trend shows and continue to make good quality options available for students. Is it going to be disruptive? You bet. Does everybody that gets to a better place go through disruption? You bet. And that's where we're at right now. I think this is the time to muster the courage and, and get our house in order and, and look ourselves in the mirror and say, are we offering every child in every part of this city a good quality school option? And in every case where we can't say we are, then look at his recommendations, especially the second one. 
I mean, this is the way we have to be thinking, in my view, to be able to offer the citizenry what they're demanding, what they expect. So we're going to shift to audience questions in one moment. I've got one open question for either Gary or Tim to address. Uh, you've been engaged in this work for decades. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you started this work initially? Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but we applied, we had to apply three times before we got um, urban prep. So we applied the first time and we were rejected, then we uh, came back a Wasn't year later. Me, was it? And uh, uh, no comment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then we came back and applied the second time and got rejected, and then uh, came back a third time, and uh, uh, Greg Richmond uh, finally decided to uh, give us the thumbs up. And we were, um, we were approved. So, so one thing I wish I had known was that we were going to get approved on the third time, because then I wouldn't have worried for those three years. I would have just kind of you know, walked in there uh, the third year. Um, I, I, I wish I had known that our uh, mission would evolve as it has evolved. I mean, we, we do a lot of, we, we don't just do schools. We have three uh, schools, one in Bronzeville, one in Englewood, and one on the near west side uh, in the university uh, village community. But, but uh, our mission is, goes way beyond that. I mean, we, we do workforce development work. We have students that leave urban prep. They go to college. We've got an alumni program led by Troy Boyd, who's here. We track and work with our alumni and counsel them while they're in college. That's something that we didn't know we were going to do uh, then. They graduate from college, and we have a fellowship program. Uh, Cameron Barnes, stand up Cameron, because I think we should give you some credit. Cameron Barnes went to Urban Prep, was in our first graduating class, went to the University of Illinois, graduated from the University of Illinois in four years, and came back to work at Urban Prep. Um, and here, now, here. you know, and this is an example, I think, of what a, an organization like Urban Prep, what any of these charter schools can do. And, and, and you know, the question was, if I, I, I didn't think of that then, that we were going to be doing so much more than just reading, writing, and uh, arithmetic. Um, I wish I had known that charters were going to get beat up so much. I think, you know, Claudia Casada is here from CPS, and, has, and love Claudia to death, and she's been there for a very long time and has seen um, urban prep grow and develop. And uh, you know, I just wish I had known that this shift was going to take place, that we're, that we're all experiencing. Um, and finally, I wish I had known that the money was going to get so funny. I mean, it's, it, it's a serious, serious, serious issue. I mean, we, are, we were always funded less than traditional public schools. Um, and it's only gotten worse over the years, yet we've demonstrated success and we are not invested in by the district uh, in, in a greater way. Um, we have to rely more heavily on philanthropic support. A bunch of our donors are in the house, so thank you. I won't shout you out in case some other schools decide to come and ask you for some money. <laughs> um, but I mean, we've got to rely heavily on philanthropic support, and uh, you know that's 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 tough. So I wish I had known that the money situation was going to. Uh, to be what it is. We're having a fundraiser on December 3rd, by the way. Go to our website. If you play poker, you're happy to come to our charity poker event. Gary. Gary. Gambling. Uh, no, 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 nope, not gambling. I'm serious. State uh, law allows it. Charity, it's like bingo at church. Bingo at church. <laughs> well, first I want to acknowledge and, and echo what uh, Tim alluded to. Uh, Greg Richmond, who's sitting over here, was with me in the early days of charter formation. And uh, we had no manual, we had no script for how to do this, how to evaluate these schools. And uh, it was this gentleman who really led the way to put uh, a coherent logical structure around how to evaluate applicants. And uh, you know, people forget, you, know, you get into these long uh, roads in your life and your career, and sometimes people forget who was there at the beginning who really brought a foundation to these things. So, Greg. I think you ought to stand up and take a bow. You could call him the, 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 ma, the father of quality in the charter movement, which was really important. Could you, if we didn't get this more or less right in the beginning, then we're probably not here today because it would have just crashed and burned. Uh, what do I wish I knew more of? I, I wish I knew that we were going to get some of the results that you saw in Andrew's data and that you've seen in some of the general data published about 
improvement in the Chicago public schools because we would have probably done some of these things that I'm going to talk about, more of them. Uh, when we created Walter Payton, Jones, Brooks, and Northside College Prep, you know, a lot of people took issue with that and said, hey, how could you do that? You're destabilizing a community by moving people around. Well, his data gives you the idea of what's going on here. Uh, we probably need more of it right now because there's nothing more than the anguish in a parent's face who tries to get into one of these schools or one of, one of the charter high schools and can't get in. So I think we have a lack of capacity in some of these top tier programs that parents would really like to have for their children. Two, uh, I wish we created more international baccalaureate opportunities for people because when I started this in the late 90s, we only had one place. It was at Lincoln Park High School. One place. Today there's 40, which allow for about 15,000 kids to have access to IB. I'm sure there's more parents that want access to that program. We created military academies. Why not? Because we're in love with the military, although we all support our military. We thought they would bring a certain discipline and perspective to marry that with education. And that has panned out very, very nicely. Near the Alk Elk Gardens on the south side, where good level options are not as plentiful as we would like, probably the top school around there is Carver Military Academy. So that's just one example. And then finally, there's the charters themselves. Uh, I will admit that when we started, we probably gave out 14 or 15 charters, because then my term ended, I left. But I'm, I'm pleased at the pace that charter schools have developed. I think the issue before the House, and Andrew will agree with me on this, I think you would too, Tim, is we have to police our own quality. Uh, we have to be the ones that really are calling the question about charter schools that aren't performing at the level we want and trying to do something about it. Just today, the Chicago Public Schools Board of Education is probably taking action on three or four schools that they believe should not go forward. I think we have, in this quest for quality and more capacity of quality schools, we have to be ever mindful of that and really be uh, good stewards of the quality that we're bringing the parents. And when something doesn't work out properly, we ought to take the action to shut it down. All right, get your questions ready. I'll invite to the stage Robin Staines, who will be uh, asking questions, and I'll join colleagues at the table. Okay. All right, I'm going to be Paul Green for the day. I will not be as funny, I will not be as snarky, but I will endeavor to at least read the questions coherently. So there are going to be, please wave your uh, questions around. I know there are folks in the audience who will gather them and bring them up. So um, I'm sure there are any number of them out there. So let's get started. Um, oh, well, I have to start with Jay Doherty's question, right? That's the, the privilege of the, yes, but I want to stay on your good side. Okay. What opportunities do charter schools offer students with intellectual disabilities? For example, autism, Down syndrome, et cetera. Sure. So uh, the special ed question is one that comes up often. It's important to first clarify that charter schools are fully open enrollment, which means that they must accept any student who applies with a disability without. They have to follow all federal law regarding uh, serving students with disabilities. Um, and so we do have individual campuses like Namaste Charter School on the southwest side, which has done such a great job with students with disabilities now, uh, parents have flocked to the school. They're 28 or 30 percent of the students there now have identified IEPs. Um, so we have a number of charter schools across the city serving students with exceptional needs at really effective and high levels. Um, I can, U of C, Chicago, U Chicago Charter School has, has another campus like that as well. So it's important to know, fully open enrollment, many schools serve students with a broad range of disabilities. All right, a question from Chuck Burbridge, also a member. How does Choice work, your, your um, discussion talked about high school schools, how does Choice work in providing education success for elementary students? Yeah, that's a great question. So we looked at the elementary school data too, and the trends were similar, although not as pronounced. At the elementary school level, about 35 to 40 percent of CPS students enroll in an elementary school that's not their zoned local option. Uh, we've seen that number increase in the past decade, uh, not quite as much, but similarly, I think the trend there will continue to grow as parents seek out different diverse options for their families. All right, uh, Josh Kaufman, from, representing the teachers from Teach Plus Fellows. How can charter teachers support district teachers, both instructionally and if the CTU goes on strike? Well, there's a light question. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I will tell you, uh, this almost goes back to the last, 
lovely to see you, Robin. I don't know if you all know who this lady is, but she's probably as responsible for some of the most cutting-edge thinking and research on education policy today at Advance Illinois. So we're lucky to have her. Uh, maybe a little history will help. One of the initial motivations, and Greg will remember this, in uh, bringing about charter schools was to try to learn what we could from people who, did, who weren't uh, constrained by uh, you know, contracts, rules, and regulations in their approach to education, and then try to bring that back into the public school system. Now, it's not all easily adopt, adopted because we, you know, we have contracts and other issues that would impede that in the ordinary public school. However, I do think there is an awful lot that can be learned from many of the charter organizations in this room that have done things, I think, exceptionally well. For example, you've got you, you've got Noble, you've got, uh, you've got Learn, you've got so many organizations in here that have done a very good job at the high school level of getting their students ready to confront the, the college dilemma. How to prepare, right? Courses on how to do it. Time in class to help examine the various options in college. Uh, how to make a, a strong application. What to do when you get there. I'm not saying this doesn't take place in CPS schools, but in visiting both sets of schools, I've seen a real focus uh, in the charter schools on making sure that the students are ready to cope with this really, really important decision. Something like that could be easily transferred back to CPS, and I think help make CPS better. From Ebony Edwards Carr from Charter Parents United, how do we create positive consistency across charter school campuses that may be in the same network, within the same network? Um, so I'll take that one. I, I think the, the question is related to charter schools that have multiple campuses. Um, so uh, how, do, how would we, for example, at Urban Prep, we've got three campuses, how do we ensure that there's quality among the three in, in the example of USC, which has multiple schools, or Learn or Noble, who have multiple campuses, CICS. Um, I, a lot of it has to do with self-policing and regulation. You've got to have uh, a plan in place internally to monitor your schools. We have a lot of healthy competition amongst our schools. Dennis Lacewell, who is the founding principal of our very first campus, the Inglewood campus, is is here today and um, competition. He always introduced himself as founding principal, um, and we had to yank him out of that position and now have him working with all three campuses to make sure that there's some level of consistency across the network. So I think you've got to do that type of thing internally. Um, and I think the district has a responsibility also in monitoring uh, what's happening inside networks and really providing the support necessary to ensure that every school within the network is, is, is doing well. All right, from Mel Dillon's, an Illinois Senate candidate for Illinois Senate. Can you talk about the specific discrepancies uh, between funding for charter schools as compared with neighborhood schools? You've mentioned Ooh. that came up in Who conversation. Mel Dillon's? Right. Okay. If I get that right? That's Mel Dillon's, my apologies. Dillon. Where's Mel? Hey, hey. Mel! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before he became a big-time politician, he used to actually write checks to Urban Prep. Now, you know, it works differently. <laughs> Andrew, you should it's possible his pay went down. Right, exactly. No, that's, that's absolutely what happened. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll take that one. So Illinois is unique uh, in the country on this. Our state law allows districts to fund charter schools uh, as little as 75% of what the district spends. Uh, we've been trying to change that for the past couple of years. We need a Springfield fix on that. Uh, we'll keep pushing for it. But also keep in mind, even at the district level, there are funding streams for which schools don't qualify. Uh, we've got to make sure that districts make charters eligible for the full range of services, categorical funds, and elsewhere to make sure Tim and other leaders like him can run these schools in a sustainable way long term. That's good for Chicago. All right, I have, I have, I have a couple more questions. Uh, Latoya Dixon? Latoya? All right. What do you say in response to criticism that when students do not meet academic standards or have behavioral problems, they're expelled and sent to low-performing schools to maintain statistics such as 100% college admission? In other yeah. words, are charters gaming things? Right. Yeah, I appreciate that, um, that question. Um, and this is one of the things that I was referring to when I, when I mentioned this kind of anti-charter rhetoric that you hear all the time. And Andrew addressed it 
um, in his presentation as well. People have these misconceptions. They have these ideas that charter schools are for-profit institutions, that charter schools are creamy students. Our, our students are all admitted via lottery. By law, our students are admitted via lottery. Um, we have about five applications for every one seat at, at Urban Prep. When we, we do the lottery, like the first time we did it, literally was a bingo drum, and I reached in, I stood there, reached in, and pulled out every single, um, every single name. Uh, we've got the tape, if you don't believe me. Um, um, and, and this past year, uh, we had our lottery. Not a single student, after they're admitted and after they enroll, we, we do some testing to figure out where we can place them inside our school and provide them with the best services. Not a single ninth grader coming to our school tested at the sixth grade level. They were all fifth grade or below. Trust me, if a school is interested in creaming, that wouldn't happen. We are not creaming or selecting students. I believe charter schools are schools of choice. Choice works both ways. A student can choose to come to Urban Prep and a student can choose to leave. And I'm not gonna be mad at a student who decides, you know what, wearing a jacket and tie every day, being at school for eight hours a day, not being, um, and being at a school that's a single gender school um, is not for me. I realize it now after I've been here for a year or two that I wanna go someplace else. I'm not gonna begrudge that student making that choice because I didn't begrudge them making the choice to come to Urban Prep in the first place. So I, I think that folks, you know, as long as we're not forcing kids out, counseling kids out, which we do not do, um, I'm, I, I, I think it's reasonable that students will, you know, the whole point of the system is choose. You know, Andrew's data show parents are making these choices. Sometimes they're gonna make a different choice after a year or two in one school and go to a different school. And that's okay if we're gonna have a system that allows choice, which I think we should. All right, uh, from Rushta Mustafa, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, though Paul never apologizes when he doesn't, so I'll just move right on. <laughs> we heard Dan Montgomery from the Illinois Federation of Teachers a few weeks ago, and he shared a study which indicated that school choice was the least pressing concern for parents across Illinois. Is the quest for choice unique to urban areas like Chicago? Well, I think you have to look at reality. I mean, people vote with their feet. These aren't figments of our imagination. Uh, I mean, these are real things. I think in many uh, instances, uh, as you're talking about, you're, the reason you have a bingo machine with a lottery ball is because there's more people that want to get in than you have space for. I mean, the, the facts speak for themselves. I, I have not seen the study that Dan uh, talks about, but Dan Montgomery's a good guy, and I've worked with Dan to do a lot of things like solve up school strike in Waukegan even. Uh, so I think they're reasonable people, but let's face it, I mean, you hire a pollster and a surveyor, and you know, you're gonna probably get back something you like. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I think that we have to be, you know, my, it depends how you ask the question, right? It's, it's very logical. Uh, but I, I think you really just have to look, use your own eyes and your own ears to, to measure this, ladies and gentlemen. The people want these things. They want them. Nobody's forcing them to, to take these. People want charter schools because they want the best for their kids, and if this can be it, that's what they want. All right, I'm gonna close with two more questions. Um, from Beatrice Ponce de Leon from Generation All at the Chicago Community Trust. Um, Gary, this is for you. You stated that it is time to give the citizenry what they are demanding. Yep. There are many parents demanding certainty of a quality high school in their neighborhood. Yep. Choice does not necessarily guarantee access to quality. We need to revitalize neighborhood high schools to meet the demands of these families. What is or can the city do for those families? Well, I think choice is a part of it. Choice has created a certain force to have people who are leaders in the school system today in the city uh, come to grips with this issue. If the, imagine if there were no charters, where this data would be. We would almost have people just captive to a lot of places that aren't getting it done. And I don't think that that's what we, we want to be about. Uh, Andrew's second point on his recommendations is where we have to be. Now what do we do about this? He recommends the students from the lowest performing school in his own not go there. They go to another place that's better. Well, let's, let's pursue that a little bit. Now, is it going to be an easy conversation? Oh, no, it's not going to be an easy conversation. Because you're going to have people that say, wait a minute, I went to Hirsch 47 years ago, 80 years ago, and I don't want it closed. Or current community members, all 80 of them, right, are going to say, I want to keep Hirsch open. And this, these are painful conversations to have I think they have to be have, had nevertheless, because otherwise we're just not gonna be able to get to the place 
where we could look every parent in the eye and say, we, we've done everything we can to provide you a good quality option for your child. You just have to go through this process. And I, as I said, it's about courage. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. You know what it's like to close a school. A lot of, lot, of, lot of difficulty there. But at the end of the day, what are we about and what are we striving for? I, I always went to any job I had with a school organization with one goal in mind. Try to do everything you can with the, with the goal of having a great quality option for every child in your district. And I think that should guide us no matter how difficult the conversation. And I know you want to wrap up, but I, I just want to mention this one thing, because Gary's like, absolutely right. These are difficult conversations. We're going to have to make them. We're going to have to take these, take these steps. And they're going to be people who do exactly what you just said. Hey, I went there a million years ago, and I don't want to see this happen. But at the same time, there are also people that recognize that they can take pride in the transformation and change and evolution of the school. My mother and both of my grandfathers attended Inglewood High School. I believe that it is a point of pride for my mother to know that Inglewood High School, when it closed, Urban Prep opened in its place. And so she, while her alma mater is no longer there, there's a piece of her alma mater there. There's a piece of my grandfather's alma mater there because Urban Prep is there. And, and this evolution needs to be embraced when it's necessary. And I'm not saying this means go close down every single um, school. I have a particular view on that, more on that later. Um, but um, we certainly need to be open to, you know, uh, to what's happening and, and recognize that just because something closes doesn't mean another window, another door, another, another school isn't opening in a, in a brand new way. All right, let's close with just one follow-up. One of the things that I think was uh, very heartwarming about the discussion today is um, some of the, the college-going rates. Lucy Reese from Charter Parents United would like to know, I understand there is a 100% acceptance rate of students going to college, getting to college. What is the percentage of students graduating with degrees? So uh, um, thanks for that uh, question. We are, we like everyone, look at our data uh, based on a six-year graduation rate. So we haven't had six years uh, since our first graduating class finished. When we do, we'll be releasing those data, we pay very close attention to what's happening with our students while they're in college. We know that our college persistence rate is about 75%, which is twice the national average for African-American males. And um, I talked to you about kind of what the data are with regard to uh, black males in CPS, the 2.5%, which has gone up a bit in the most recent study to 6%. Um, we are confident that we are going to uh, exceed the college uh, uh, degree attainment rates uh, that we've seen in the city and across the country for young black men. Andrew, any data on that generally across the charter high school population? Yeah, it's a great question. And many more charters are now focused on this as an area um, of, of real accountability for them. We don't have a large number of graduating high school classes that have gone uh, six years into college, but we do see preliminarily the schools that have done that uh, higher than average based on CPS uh, current rankings. Hopefully, though, we'll lead the, the whole district forward because everyone's focused on this quite clearly now. All right, and with that, please join me in thanking this panel one more time, and we're adjourned. Good job.